Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Is this a story or just a bunch of things? And what is a story? And I think most of us have had, a, at least in, at least in uh, uh, European and American, uh, North American education, there's usually a pretty clear idea of, 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 of narrative. Um, it's something with the beginning, a middle, and an end, maybe not in that order. It's about a structure. Usually it has a character and a world and something changes. People might allude to, uh, to go back to Aristotle, but whatever. In fact, there's a prejudice, there's a bias built into our theories of narrative. And that bias, as far as I can tell, is that it's predicated, it's built on media forms that are fixed. The book has a fixed sequence of pages, a fixed sequence of words. Film has a fixed sequence of images. The behind the generation, the creation of uh, narrative theory are fixed. They're really good in terms of dissemination. They're really good in terms of having one example that reaches a lot of people, the very same example. And it's, produces really good narratives. But the question is, what happens if you have... Obras, mas a pergunta é, e se você tivesse uma mídia que não fosse fixa, onde a sequência não é estabelecida e fixa, será que isso é, seria possível de gerar uma narrativa? E, e eu quero argumentar que a resposta é sim. Precisamos pensar numa narrativa, não tanto quanto um texto de palavras fixas, mas se pensarmos numa narrativa como uma combinação de um ambiente e de uma, com um agente. Quando eu vou à Disneylandia, eu posso caminhar da forma... Putting dots, I'm putting together a story. And just as in a novel, when I'm on page 13, I don't know what's on page 14 or 15, I'm always like part of the way there, the same at Disneyland. I don't know the full story yet. I'll only know it at the end of my day. So I think if we think about things like theme parks, museums, interactive fiction, immersive theater, uh, AR, VR, ARGs, all of these would be unstable platforms, unfixed platforms that are perfectly capable of generating narrative experience. I have to do my work as a user. The environment designer has to do her work or his work as a, as a designer, but together it's a powerful sort of uh, encounter. And in fact, there's a really good argument, a deep argument about this that goes back to um, pre-literary times. Uh, the, the writer, uh, the Italian uh, cultural critic, Carlo Ginsberg, makes, I think, a very good argument. He says the fanatic tradition, so hunting, is really the origin of narrative. When you hunt, you, you're, you're in the world and you see marks. You see, maybe it's a footprint or maybe who knows what it is. Or you might see a broken branch or fur. And you connect the dots and you create an analysis and you generate a story. For Ginsburg, this is the origins of narrativity. And it's something that's really important today because we have so many media forms whether games or interactive documentaries or all that other stuff I mentioned that allow shared agency, agency that I, I'm part of the agency, but so is the designer of the space. Multiple, multiple points of view. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges here is that 10 of us can go to Disneyland or 10 of us can play Grand Theft Auto and we're going to have 10 different experiences. We're going to have 10 different structures and, and, and we're going to see 10 different things. It's not just 10 different interpretations like with a book. It's actually 10 quite different experiences. And those are hard to commodify. Those are hard to write about for critics because critics do better with a similar structure. So I think there's an academic prejudice against this space. But I think for people working with new media and for people working with space like architects and, and city planners, it's really important to, to think this through as a kind of narrative structure. So to me, the big difference between these two is that a, a book or a movie is like a tour bus. A bunch of us are on it. It's a linear experience. We have the same experience. Everyone on that bus is gonna hear the same uh, story from the tour guide. 
It can be a great story, informative, nothing wrong with it. But wandering in a city is also valuable. Wandering in a city is highly personalized. You stop and start wherever you want. You look in the windows you're interested in. You keep track of the street names and numbers so you don't get lost. And that too is a, is a rewarding experience. The two actually work really well together. But what I'm trying to do is make the case to say that wandering, like all those other examples I gave, is also narrative. That this, this is a narrative conceit. This is not, a, this is not just some kind of uh, um, neutral experience. Okay, let's jump into the space. I love, I love this quote. It's, uh, <laughs> it's true, it's true. If it doesn't have a name, we, we kind of look at our watch and wait to go onto the place that does have a name. Um, so I'm gonna talk a lot about augmentation here. And um, this is what I don't mean. I don't mean hollow lens and I don't mean magic leap. I don't mean putting a big goggles on your head and, and having the goggles between you and the world. What I mean is using technologies, really simple technologies and also complex technologies to reveal uh, layers, to reveal the layers of time, to reveal the layers of experience uh, in, in our spaces. This is a really wonderful example. This is a, a firm in Berlin, Art Plus Com. It's an architecture and a media company. Uh, prototypes. Uh, the Invisible Shape of Things Past is this one. And basically what this is, that green thing that you see is a movie. A movie taken maybe in 1915. And what they've done is they've spatialized the movie, in this case, a tracking shot, so it looks like a, a train. But if it were a panorama, it would look like a wheel of cheese. So they've spatialized the shot and they've put it on the location where it was taken. And the interface allows a couple of different things. On one hand, they have these two dimensional maps and you can embed these 3D objects a film shot, uh, you know, a, a movie that's now like a, a 3D box. You can navigate your way into that and that's what you see in the bottom images so that it starts to look more and more like an image and you can go in it and you can go right inside that box and be the movie. But what they've also done is geolocate that movie or at least the plan was to geolocate that movie. So it's actually right there on the street where it was taken. And it strikes me that this is a a brilliant idea for archiving some of our audiovisual experience, but also for archiving some of the experience of, a, of an urban uh, situation. So behind this, of course, is a bunch of theory. And um, just to mention a few names, but, but Pierre Nora, Pierre Nora, uh, the Lieu de Memoire, uh, Places of Memory, is a really, if you don't know this book, it's a really wonderful book about memorialization and, and using place as a, as a reminder. And of course, Michel uh, de Certeau, uh, The Invention of Everyday Life, uh, where he talks about places and spaces, places as basically abstracted things and spaces as lived, inhabited, full of meaning or the tour and the map. The map is the abstract drawing. The tour is that thing come to life. He's, you know, it's, it's a little binary, but it's a really rich, uh, I think a real provocation to think about some of what we'll talk about. And in the center, there's an image by the situationist uh, Guy Debord uh, from his psychogeography. It's a psychogeography of Paris. It's Paris as remembered. Paris as experienced. And it's, if you think of it, most of us, if you think of how we navigate in cities, we, we, you know, we have memories associated with different places. Uh, a place where I had my first date, a place where I had a, uh, the guy cheated me on the bill, a place where my car got a ticket, whatever. I, every time I walk by, I have the same kind of recollection. And what, what Debord has done here is to try to map a Paris, an experiential Paris, a remembered Paris. It's not the whole city, it's not the grid, it's not an abstract you know, uh, rendering of the city. 
it's a live, it's an emotion rich uh, uh, set of encounters. And the, the work on augmentation comes from theorists, for my mind, it's helped by theorists that work in this space. Uh, okay. So augmentation, of course, is a really old practice. And what you're seeing here is uh, Jerusalem via Dolorosa. And if you're Christian and you go to this, this uh, street, it's a little, it's a little uh, tiny little street. And if you're Christian and you know about this stuff, like if you pass this address, it has meaning. It has, it has meaning. It's the sixth station of the cross uh, where Veronica used her veil or, or whatever. I'm not so sure about what happened, but, but something like that. Um, it has incredible significance. But if you're Jewish or if you're Islamic, it's, it's meaningless. It, it's just a, it's a problem. Too many tourists come and block the way. Uh, augmentation in this case is something that people who know recognize. And it has significance for them and for others, it has no significance. What you see on the right, the Stolpersteine, uh, these, what that, it's German and it means uh, a stumbling stone. And this was an initiative to help remember uh, the Jewish people who were taken from their homes and, and taken to camps. And so in front of people's house, in front of houses or businesses throughout Germany, but also throughout the Netherlands, uh, it, it, there, there are these small, you can see they're smaller, it's about a half the size of a brick. It's quite small. And it gives the information about, about you know, in this case, uh, uh, Max uh, Meyer and uh, he was taken to a camp, but he survived and uh, got out through Switzerland and Spain and America. So this is a, a good story. This is a survivor. Most of them are sad stories. Uh, but what this does, if you know about these, when you walk through the city, suddenly you see a different city. You see embedded in the city streets, references to a period, the period of the 1930s and early 1940s, when people were being taken from their homes and taken into camps. And it, it just transforms the meaning of urban architecture, uh, of, of, an, of an urban experience. Subtle, if you don't know about it, you may never see it. But once you know, you can't not see it. That's augmentation. And it's using a very simple technology to do it. It doesn't get simpler than, than graffiti or stickers, augmentation, whether, you, whether for tagging purposes, advertising purposes, whatever purpose, really simple way to augment. And if you're someone who tags, if you're someone who does graffiti tags, then you, if you're someone like me who doesn't do that, I, unless it's really extravagant, I, would not, I, don't, I don't even notice it. So, so again, augmentation doesn't work for everyone. It's only for those who are clued in. And, and we know that there are tons of examples. We'll, we'll come back to Yellow Arrow, but it could be as simple as chalk on the sidewalk, uh, or it could be as fancy as a, an official metal you know, plaque on the wall. In this case, for the Triangle Shirt Fire in New York, 1911. A lot of people died in this fire. Uh, but what a wonderful way to, to remember this and to, and to re recover, to restore a connection with the past. It doesn't take much technology, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's, it's, it's abundant, it's all around us. Um, just to give a few examples from Utrecht. Um, so Utrecht was at a time, the, the, it was, it was a, a Roman city and it was the borders of the empire. And that border has been marked, what you see on the, on the right, is a metal, like a metal plate. And that, that, that thing runs through the city, that metal plate. And there's a little a map, there's a map on it. So you can kind of see the, 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 the map of the, of the edges of the Roman empire. And that crack in the middle, what that is, is that there's underneath it is a steam. And the ste at nighttime, the steam comes up and there's a green light in there. This picture is not a great picture, but on a good, on a good night, it's like a green fog wall and you have to walk through that green fog to enter the empire and to exit the empire. And what a, what a genius way to, to, um, to help rem remind us that this was a border city for the Roman empire. This was the line that separated the barbarians from the civilized world. Um, two other examples from Utrecht. Uh, uh, 
the the little the arrow that's lit up it, it's just a throughout the city you see these little arrows that are that light light up at night and they're pointing out a tour there's a tour of uh of uh, projections, like some buildings are, are lit up at night and some of them have projections on them. And a lot of them are pretty subtle and arty, but it's a lovely, it's just a lovely way to mark the city out and give you, especially with COVID, I walk a lot at night, I've discovered so much and this is a beautiful tour. On the right, it's using, you know, a pretty typical uh, QR code. This is a, a, a advertisement for the museum one of the museums is having an exhibit on the walled city. It says, do you feel safe in the walled city? And when you, when you put your phone on the QR code, what you see is, a, is a, 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 you're, you're in a place where there used to be a wall in the old city. And now you can see that wall back again. That, that code triggers the, the appearance on your phone. Um, this is, to say this really quickly, I mean, it's a wonderful essay by Jonathan Culler. And he basically says that, that markers, markers are the things that make something something. Um, I don't know if you have this in Brazil, but, but, but up here at, at tourist places, often there's a little sign that tells you where to stand, like Kodak, you know, take your picture here. And what you get is a picture that is the picture everyone's always seen of, of a thing, not an unusual picture. But it really, if I think of how Japanese tourists come to Utrecht and they always take the same picture, because it makes it tangible, it makes it real. It constitutes the place by seeing and by capturing that vision in a photograph. Uh, so this idea of the marker uh, is an old idea and we've just seen a bunch of examples and it's really the idea behind aug uh, augmentation. And one of the things that makes all this work, you'll remember the, the Disney World picture, you know, that you have to go to this place and do stuff. We are hunters and gatherers. Uh, we had the Carlo Ginsburg thing about the hunting tradition, but we are hunters and gatherers. And if you can load a space with information, people will hunt and they will gather. This is a sound system. So this is an audio augmentation system. Uh, it's a piece of software called Roundware, roundware.org, uh, by a guy named Halsey uh, Burgund. He's, he's in our lab. And basically, you can drop, you can drag and drop sound assets, and you can put them wherever you want so that they can only be heard there, like on that spot. They're even directional. The, the latest version of this is directional, like you can hear which side, the, the sound points in one direction. Um, I can now say this because I won't get arrested. I put one of these in Donald, I put a sound in Donald Trump's bedroom in the White House. I don't think he ever heard it, but I geolocated. It's a brilliant system and it's great for urban storytelling. It's great for adding the, the, the history of things and of places because the, the, it's quite a precise tagging system. And you know the new acoustical technologies are great. So this is Bose frames. Uh, I don't I don't know if you guys have those or, or not, but um, they look like sunglasses. But actually, it's a brilliant. It's acoustical. Like your ears are open. There's no plugs in your ears. It's a really good quality acoustical sound that comes through the that thick thing on this side. So you can walk around in a city and you can experience. You know, it's 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 triggered by by your phone is the driver, so it's it's location sensitive. Um, your ears are not covered. You can walk around in a safe way in a city and still experience these, these incredibly rich uh, tours. So here's an example uh, by Fran Panetta. And Fran is, uh, was formerly new media editor at the Guardian newspaper, very important for, for, for media experimentation in England. It's called Hackney Here. And she tells the stories of uh, of this place called Hackney, the people that live there, the fa factories that were there and taken away, the social problems that are there. And you hear interviews with people, you hear historical recordings, a wonderful way to uncover the deep history, the complexity, the contradiction of a space. And in a way that doesn't disturb anyone, that doesn't compete with anything. 
You could put thousands of stories here and it would be fine. This is an old, I mean, it's an early, uh, it's an early system. It's called Yellow Arrow from 2004. And this was basically, you would get an arrow. You, you see those yellow arrows and the arrow has a code and you, you could put an arrow anywhere you wanted. And then with your phone, you would, you would put in that code and leave a message. So if you stand here and look in the direction of the arrow, you'll see a, a, an image that looks like it's Hitchcock's rear window, whatever. And someone else can come and tag it with other kind of uh, information. And so what starts to happen is you build up the annotation of a space uh, by different people commenting but all of it's virtual, all of it's in the ether somewhere. You could access it through a computer or you could access it through a phone. But it became, became, a, became a, a system of, it was a global system of annotating space, people telling stories about space, people giving their memories or, or whatever. And, you know, the, obviously the, the tourism business has jumped on this. So you can now do historical tours, in this case, uh, a wool worker in the 15th century wandering around in Florence. And you could, because the architecture has not changed very much, you, you really can start to reimagine this space uh, by, by using this, this augmentation uh, strategy. The gaming industry has jumped on this fast. This is a, a, by a company called Niantic, a Google, Google company. And Niantic, uh, you might know them for Pokemon Go, if any of you play that. But before Pokemon Go was this game called Ingress, where they tried to figure out like how people navigate urban space and what they, you know, they learned a lot. But basically what the game tried to do was to take monuments, historical monuments in cities and wrap them in the game. So this is a I don't know what this is, power node 307, you know, and your job is to take it over. Niantic argued that this would get people to, to uh, do tourism, to visit historical parts of cities. I'm not so sure that that is true. I mean, I think you might go to that part of a city, but you're looking for power node 402. You're not looking for this piece of sculpture by whoever. Uh, anyway, interesting idea. And um, to sort of gamify this and to sort of turn the world into a game through augmentation. Wonderful project from the city of Montreal in Canada called uh, Cité Memoir, where on the sides of 50 different buildings and maybe a few trees, they've done large scale projection of 50 moments in Montreal's history. These are moving images there's soundtracks you can hear on your phone or they have little um, directional sound places where you can stand and uh, hear them. And it's a wonderful way to tell the story of the city on, on the surfaces of the city. And the images are stunning. That, that, that projection on a tree is one of the most beautiful images as the tree moves a bit in the wind. Really, really exquisite stuff. So a great way to let people find a story a great way for the city to, to, to celebrate itself and its history, and a great way to get people to walk around and see the buildings with new eyes. And again, I mean, there's a million projects that do this. Uh, this one does it in a very different way where, where this is a public project. There's a real power to this because it's projection. Everyone walking by, driving by, everyone sees this. I think it's brilliant and we'll come back and talk about this at the end. Uh, this is maybe the more typical way, this uh, Chicago Zero Zero project, where basically the past and the present are combined, but they're combined through your phone or they're combined in a tablet. Here, it's private, just you, just you, the user can see this. And you can manipulate it, you can move in and move out, you can, you can, you can, you know, you can do stuff with the image, but it's only you and your phone. Whereas this is public, and there's something quite powerful about this. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the memories we've talked about so far have been public memory, common memory, collective memory, but there's also a way, as I suggested with this uh, Guy Debord uh, psychogeography map, there's also a ways of, of, 
of mapping memory, of ma mapping personal memory, personal associations. And, um, you know, it's, oh, it's apps, of course. Wallamy, I think that's like, there's a song called All of Me, All of Me, Wallamy. I don't know if that's what it's based on. But this is like virtual graffiti, the virtual tagging. You can leave messages for people without painting a wall. You can, but it's persistent. It stays there and people can, you went and you can leave notes and a little bit like yellow arrow, except not even a yellow arrow, just your phone. Uh, car finder app. Okay, I don't know who forgets where their car is, but especially a car like that. But if you forgot uh, uh, your, your you know, car finder app, annotate space. It's your personal guide to a space telling you where your things are, your car is in that space. Uh, someone like Steve Mann, Steve used to work at MIT, um, used to walk around all the time, like 100% of his waking hours, he was recording and building a data set, both to, to document his life, but also to augment it and also to kind of rebuild it and allow him to enter, re-enter his life by recordings that he made of it. Um, and of course, we know that whether you have an iPhone or uh, um, an Android phone, um, the apps, there's like a, a ton of apps for, for, um, for doing augmentation. So this is really, uh, I think this is really about to come on, on stream. It hasn't done quite well yet. And maybe if Apple comes up with its glasses that allow you to see stuff rather than using your phone, this might kick off, but we'll see. Uh, and I just wanna end with this image, uh, this section, Photosynth. Um, they changed this, this no longer exists, but this allowed the photographs of hundreds of people, I think up to six or even 800 people, 800 people's different photographs could be melded into a space, a 3D space that you could navigate within. So augmentation in this case is, is something virtual, something that would exist on our computers, but allow us to see the world through those many, many different eyes of, of others. I want to give a quick study here of a project I'm trying to get off the ground in Budapest right now. Uh, I don't know what you know about Hungarian politics right now, but they're not so good. Um, you guys, you guys know that, and, and with like Trump, the, they were all well, they're all buddies, uh, Orban. So this is a bit of a politically repressive uh, situation right now, and what we're going to look at is is a square called Liberty Square. And uh, here it is from the sky. And here it is as a, as a map. And this is a really interesting space because in it, much of, the, much of the conflict and much of the contradiction and some of the really acute uh, problems I think of uh, Hungarian history are there. And as a tourist, what would you know? You go as a tourist, and this is the main thing that tourists see. The current president put this up. It's a monument to victims of fascism. The, the guy with his arms stretched out, that's uh, Gabriel, the, 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 the angel. Uh, I, think, I think it is. I can't really recognize him, but it, <laughs> it's said to be. Um, and he's the patron of Hungary. So he represents Hungary. He's holding the, the, hung, the Hungarian orb. And coming in from the sky in cast iron, ragged and, and poorly, uh, you know, with rough edges is the German eagle. And this is a monument to victims of fascism. And it's a monument that among others, the Jewish community objected to. Entre outros, a comunidade judaica fez objeções a este monumento. That's, you know, to victims of fascism. And the reason is because Hungary was an ally of Germany. The Hungarians and the Germans worked together to, throughout the Third Reich. Only in the last two months of the war did Hungary finally, when Germany was losing, Hungary finally like stopped being an ally. So this blames the Germans for atrocities for, and for fascism that was Hungarian. But the fascists are back in Hungary. So like that's, they're going to point at the Germans. They don't want to admit that they were the fascists. And so there was such controversy that they solved it. If you look at the, the leg of the eagle, there's something on it. Like they would put a band 
on a, on a bird's leg, a wild bird to track it. And that band has the dates of the two months <laughs> that Germany was technically at war with Hungary. Anyway, this so upset people that they started to put up a counter monument a monument made up of suitcases and shoes and photos and stones and stories. And this is, the, this is one of the stories I want to tell. The problem right now is that the government under Orban comes in here and they take all this stuff away. They don't want it. They think it doesn't look good. And so this counter monument, this critical monument is taken away. So I think, well, I can restore this virtually. I can, I can in fact, I can collect stories, the stories behind that suitcase or that briefcase or those shoes. I can collect those stories and, and you can hear them on the spot. Right behind this place, so just to give you orient you on the map, uh, this thing is on the, where you see the uh, Uni Credit Bank. Um, the thing I'm going to show you is there, and the, the thing I just showed you, the monument, is just that first street away from it. So just behind, just behind this, if you were to turn your back, you'd see this. This is a still fascist church, a temple. I don't know what it is. It's an it's a, a, a arrow cross uh, a church. You see the, the, the cross in front of it. This is it. You can see in the doorway, there's a statue of this church. And it's, it's Horte. Horte was the Hungarian leader that worked with the Nazis. So you're looking at a, a monument to victims of fascism and right behind your back is, is, is a temple with the guy, the head fascist still there. Like it's, it's astounding, it's unbelievable. So we're trying to find a way to use augmentation to build, to make these contradictions visible. At the opposite side of the square from the fascist church is this thing. This is a Soviet memorial to the Soviets, Soviet soldiers who died liberating Hungary. And because there are bodies under it, Orban wanted to tear it down, but because there are bodies under it, he, he's not allowed to touch it. So what did Orban do? He put a statue of Reagan <laughs> next to it. So this is a space that, and there's a hundred more things to say about it, but it's so full of contradiction and so full of, of, of icons that help us understand the history and the complexity of Hungarian culture that I'm trying to find ways to use both sound and, and the government doesn't want me to do this. That's the other thing. Um, so we're trying to find ways to, that, that virtually allow us to connect the dots and have people see what's going on. This is the American embassy also there. You can always tell American embassies because they're, they have defenses. This is the guy we have next to our embassy, an American general from World War I, he did something in Hungary. But really what this guy did, why he's really famous, he killed like 10,000 Filipinos. And when he was done with that, they brought him back to America to kill strikers, uh, labor strikers. So he's not without problems either. Anyway, that's almost at the end. Oh, the poor translators. Um, I want to right now just say a few words about a project we're just starting and that might be of interest to some of you. Um, it's a project uh, we just announced and it's called Claiming Our Commons, Augmenting Reality in Public Space. And we're going to do this for the next two years. We just started in November. And it's my lab. We're, we're, we're leading it. Uh, it's Centre Fee in uh, Montreal, so that's kind of an arts uh, center. And it's uh, International Documentary Festival Amsterdam's Doc Lab in Amsterdam. And basically what we're trying to do is better understand how to work with public space, how to annotate public space, how to augment public space, how to tell these stories in a way that, especially, especially now with so much political polarization, how can we, history is a sensitive thing. How can we tell us histories in a way that bring people together and don't just divide them? How can we tell stories that, that help us understand better the, the complexities of our present and don't just you know, have people shut their eyes or shut their ears? What you're looking at here, uh, I'll show you the, what they're looking at in a minute at 
in a night shot. But this is, again, the most primitive form of augmentation, signs. You go somewhere, there's a little sign, you read it, and it, it informs and maybe even changes what you see. Okay, here's what they're looking at. They're looking at this statue, and it's a statue of, of uh, the leader of the, of the Confederate of the Southern forces in America's Civil War. That's General Lee. So it's a very controversial statue because the, the Southern general was defending slavery. And a lot of the Southern states still have big statues because they, they never got over slavery. They, I, if they could have it back, they probably would. So after the, you, you might've heard about the guy, George Floyd, who was, who was killed by the police. We, it happens a lot, but this guy, they knelt on him and, and, uh, for a long time and killed him. So after that, there were a lot of uh, uprisings in American cities. And this is a, what, what happened here? So people started to say, we should take down these statues. We should take down these statues of, 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 of these, these pro-slavery heroes. And it's great controversy because it's also history. So this is where you see augmentation. Here's some projection mapping. Uh, a guy named Devin Klein does this and he projects onto the staff. He's projecting a black uh, revolutionary leader, Frederick Douglass, on, onto and projection, projection, projecting Black Lives Matter onto General Lee. So they didn't take the statue away, but they completely changed its meaning. Here's the same statue with a different projection, Breonna Taylor. This is the woman who a bunch of police just broke into her apartment and shot her like she's a nurse. She, she was home from work, from, from working with sick people and they, they just like shot her. Wrong, it was the wrong address. Uh, so this is a way to point out the contradictions. And yet it doesn't, it's not, doesn't do permanent damage. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not take away the statue or keep the statue. It's not that kind of a debate. It's about augmenting the statue, annotating the statue. This needs no comment. This was uh, uh, Trump's hotel in Washington. It does raise an interesting question. Public spaces, every culture has different ideas of public space. In some countries, it's dangerous. Some parts of public space in New York, Central Park is a dangerous place. Uh, so the question is, what is exa what exactly what is the public and who is the public for? And are there publics that are for some people and not other people? And in this case, are there spaces that become public when you annotate them, when you augment them? This is a private hotel, but when you put a projection on it, does it turn it into something that's semi-public? Uh, another great example of that idea, uh, where you know you don't want to destroy Jeff Koons' uh, balloon dog, I guess. But here's a great way to to modify it, to leave your mark, to to have a commentary uh, without doing any damage to the original, and and allowing you to put this thing wherever wherever you want. So what we're looking at here is we're trying to figure out, we're trying to really think with theorists of public spaces, how to, how to really think about the, 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 the public in a robust way. Right now, the main people that mark public space is the city, the city puts up signs, and advertisers. Coca-Cola is allowed to mark a public space, but I'm not allowed to mark a public space. So do these tools I've been, do these techniques I've been showing you, do they allow us to change that? Do they allow the public to have a say in it? And is there a way for, for us to think of, of, of augmentation strategies where people work together, where people can, you know, where instead of one person blasting their message and someone else a counter message, actually we can design collaboration into the, into the augmentation process. There's a nice one that brings back the wall that no longer exists in Berlin, the Berlin Wall, and with it, the graffiti, and it even allows you to add your own graffiti. Uh, so back to this last image. Um, yeah, I think, I think these technologies offer us ways, simple ways, but also complex ways to, to excavate time, to make it possible to slide in and out of different eras. 
to annotate space with its own past and to make that past accessible for anyone to make multiple stories possible. It's not about one narrative, it's about multiple narratives. And ideally, and I, I don't know good examples of this, ideally find ways for us to collaborate and come up with a collaborative history, a shared history. And with that, I will stop. Hey, thank you, I've said it already, but I just wanna say again, the questions are really terrific. I want to thank you for that. I'm really excited about learning more about your work. It sounds like your, your work is right on the cutting edge and I want to learn a lot more about it. So to be continued. And you know what? It's, I don't know if there's a way for me to get a copy of the chat, but I see there's a lot of good stuff in there and I'd love to dig down and, and see. So thank all, I mean, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm amazed that so many people have stayed this long and uh, thank the translators for 